Hey y'all, welcome to Flatirons Church Online. My name's Kila and I'm pumped you're joining us today. Now, one of my favorite things about this online community is that we're watching from all over the place. We're watching from different cities, different states, even different countries. And don't get me wrong, while I think this is one of the coolest things about Flatirons Online, I know that it comes with its own challenges. It's hard to feel connected to your church when we're so spread out. So there's two things you can do today to stay connected to Flatirons. First, follow us on social and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We create content all week to encourage and equip our community. Second, you can text us, text NEXT to 80857 to receive three texts a week from us that will encourage you and challenge you to go deeper in your faith. All right, that's enough for me. Let's get into the service. Every organization, be that a business, a corporation, a marriage, a family, and even a church, is guilty of, of this thing called missional drift, meaning we started in the right direction, we had great intentions, but over time we kind of got off to the left, we got off to the right. So every once in a while, it's a really good thing, a healthy thing, to call a timeout and say, are we still on track? Are we still committed to those, those driving principles, those, those immovable truths that drive everything we do? Those are called values. That's what we're gonna be looking at this month. So this, this summer, uh, Robin and I had a, a chance to kind of have a dream of a lifetime come true. We celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary in Rome, Italy, and we took all the tours and all the guides and all the buses, but probably this area right here captivated my attention the most. This is the Roman Forum. About 2,000 years ago, at the time when Jesus was walking the earth, Paul was walking the earth, all the disciples were, 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 were spreading the gospel. This was literally the center of the universe in terms of education, in terms of power, in terms of politics, in terms of military, in terms of sexuality. It all happened right there. And as you walk through those what are now ruins, the thing that kind of captures your attention is that just the, the scale, the, the, the weight of, of their buildings. They're huge temples dedicated to all of their gods, asking them to give them all of those things, power, military, education, sexuality, it was all dedicated to that. And these giant pillars they would erect, they would put up these huge, huge temples. And some of those came from other parts of the world. And the statement was, the world is ours because we're the best. But if you look over my shoulder, it's now just rubble. As a matter of fact, the only buildings that survived from that time era it's because Christians turned them into churches. Right over here on my right is the Roman Senate. It was the center of decision-making for the world. And the only reason it's still standing today is because Christians turned it into a church and preserved it. What drove all that? Um, what, what drove the need to, to, to build the greatest military of all time, to build roads that span the earth, to build temples? And it comes back to what I mentioned earlier, values. Values drive everything we do. It drove the Roman Empire for a long time and then it crumbled. One of the questions I wanna look at uh, over, over the next several weeks is, what are your values? What are those foundational pillars that prop up everything you do? If, if you were to say, what is my why? You would point to one of those, those pillars. Why do you do that like you do that? We would point to one of those pillars. And it's certainly true in, in business and organization, but it's also true in your own life. What are the pillars that drive your life, that hold up everything and say, this is important. You might call them this. These are the hills I would die on. These are immovable. They have to be in place. In my business, in my marriage with Robin, I have to have these in place and how I lead my family and how I lead my children. But here's what I wanna look at too. What values drive Flatirons Community Church? I think, I think everybody agrees with the statement that values drive everything we, we do. The question is, can you articulate that? If I were to come over to your house, could you say, we do that because we value this. We don't do that at our house because we value that. And it's the same thing with a, with a church, right? Why does Flatirons do the things it does? Why don't they do things like other churches? Values drive everything we do. So over the next eight weeks, what I wanna do is I wanna lean into Flatirons values, and then you're gonna have to kind of, are those my values as a husband, as a wife, as a family, all right? Very, very simply, here's the five things that we're gonna work through in the next eight weeks. The first thing is this, we gotta know God. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that you know God. How do you get to know God? Through his word. We're gonna spend some time on that. Then you have to come to a point in your life where you trust Jesus. I put my faith in Jesus and what he's done for me. And that comes with some obstacles sometimes, all right? Which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about happened here in Rome quite a bit. The third one is Jesus said that when, when, when we put our trust in him, he would move inside of us and he would change things and not just change things, but, but would lead us through his spirit. So we have no God, Trust Jesus, now we're led by the Spirit. And this one's really, really important. None of this gets, none, none of this happens without all of us pulling together and being uni united in mission. 
right? You bring something to the table, he brings something to the table, she brings something to the table, and when we combine all those gifts, saying that's the goal, that's where we're going, we're united in mission. That's the number one prayer Jesus had for his church, that we would be one, that we would be united, which brings us to the last value, and that's this, we are engaged, we are engaged in the Great Commission. It's not enough just to, 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 for us to be saved and circle our wagons. There's people out there in the world that really need to know about God and his son Jesus and, and, and experience eternal life. We'll take that to the ends of the earth. Those are our values. It's my values at my house. I hope it's your values at your house. It certainly is the values at Flatirons. So let's go on a journey together and let's figure out what's the most important thing. All right, here we go. I just realized I have on the same shirt. I own more than one shirt. Anyway. It's so good to be back back home. Uh, I, we've, we've been around for like the, the last month and we've been doing a, a really, really good stuff, important stuff with our mission partners. And then Robin and I celebrated 40 years of marriage. Uh, Robin says it's like the 10 best years of her life. But, uh, but I, I, listen, I don't, I, I'm, done tra- I'm done traveling. I already told like the powers that be that, that run, run my life and my calendar, I don't want to do this next year. I don't want to be gone as much. I, I'm selfish maybe. I, I think actually I'm just old. Uh, and I'm, I just like being home. I love being here. Do you, do you love being here? Come on, all right, I love, I love, I love. anyway. Now having said I, I wish that, I wish I could have had time to go into everything that I was able to experience with God on three different continents in three weeks, meeting with people and seeing what God is doing around the world. And I don't have time to do that today, but I will be weaving it in uh, all, all through the next eight weeks uh, between now and Thanksgiving. That's when this series is over, eight weeks, all right? And, uh, but I'll say this, all right, um, God is doing amazing things around the world. Through people, the most amazing people, and the people that I met have, have risked and, and some have lost everything. You say, well, why, why do they do that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll quote a verse that we're gonna get to here in a few minutes. They, they risk everything because, look at this, this verse, great verse, says this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, they're not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And, and so they, they asked me to bring a message back here to Flatirons, and it's not just thank you for financially supporting them. Some of them don't even know where the money comes from, all right? But, but they have just one request. Really, write this down, all right? We pray for us. Because when you pray for us from here, from wherever you are, then you, this is what they said, then you are partnering with God and with us and you are just as much a part of what God is doing over there as we who, who live over there, right? Bottom line, they, they know that if, if we don't pray, and they're, they're asking us to pray, if, but if we don't pray, they know it won't work. Prayer is the most important thing. Prayer is the most valuable, instrumental, consequential, if we don't have it, it won't happen, part of what we do. That's what they wanted me to tell you. They would, they, they would say, say this, prayer drives everything. And that leads us to, into where we're gonna be going over the next eight weeks in, in this series, asking and, ans- and answering questions like this. So what is the most important thing? Or, or what is or what are the most important values that drive everything that we choose to do or, or choose not to do? As a church called Flatirons Community Church, but also those same values translate over to how we choose to live our lives as men and women who, who say the same thing. Let's just read this out, out loud together. Here we go, one, two, three. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now I wanna you know, hold on to that. What's the most important thing? And maybe the question would be, or better ask like in the context or from this perspective, there, there, there's a lot of things in your life that are important, but not all things are equally important, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not saying or suggesting that, that what you have going on all week or later today, I'm not saying that's not important. Maybe it is, maybe, maybe it isn't. I'm just throwing out the idea that some things are more important than other things, are more consequential, more value than other things. And if we don't pay attention, sometimes, and not, we don't even do it on purpose, that just the pace of life or the tyranny of the urgent, I gotta do this right now, so sometimes we drift off mission and discover that our lives are being run by things that feel important, but they really, they're not important. And the most important things like that we started out holding on to and like holding up and got going for, it, it, somewhere it got lost or got pushed down the list. Sometimes it even got buried and a day comes and some of us have had that day when we kind of look around and realize that I have spent a lot of time and money and effort pursuing something that's very different than what I started out to pursue. I got lost in a long way. So that, that's what we're gonna try to sort out. Like what are the values, the foundational, like, 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 like pillars or, or, or most important truths that drive this church that, as an organization, but that drive you individually as a man, as a woman, as a husband, as a wife, married, single, old, young, whatever, every, every part of your life. Like what do you mean every part? Every part. Values drive, like this is how we're gonna do marriage. 
This is how we're gonna do family. This is how we're gonna parent our children. This is how we're gonna spend our money. This is how we're gonna express sexuality. This is how we're gonna choose what we're gonna entertain ourselves with. Uh, our values drive how we're gonna do friendship. How are you gonna fight your battles and what battles are even worth fighting? How are you gonna manage conflict? How are you gonna walk into and out of seasons of joy and happiness and seasons of pain and loss? Something will drive that. Some foundational truth, some value will drive and define how you will see life and what's most important. And then you will live out what you believe is most true and most valuable. Now, now today, all right, I'm fired up. I, I'm so excited. I, I, I know what I'm about to teach you. Some of you are gonna be so mad, but it's my spiritual gift to make some of you mad. Anyway, so <laughs> today, today is a, a whole lot of introduction and we'll, we'll get into that first pillar or, or value here in a minute, but I, I wanna give you some context for what we're gonna do and, and how we're gonna do it. First of all, we're gonna be basing a lot of this whole series uh, uh, from passages found out of the book of Romans. So if you have a Bible with you and at all of our campuses, there are, there are stacks of Bible back there. They're free, but we're going to be in Romans chapter one. If you have a Bible app, you know, start getting that. So, so the book of Romans is a book of the Bible written by an, a man named Paul, right? It was a letter written from Paul to this, this young church, all right, that had been planted by some men and women that most likely, and we studied this a few months ago, uh, first heard about Jesus back in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and then they went home home to Rome and they planted a church. We're Christians now uh, and we need a church here. And they, they started a church, which is a huge deal. See, we'll learn more about what's going on in that church uh, and what's going on around them in the, in the few weeks. Now, I, here's what I need you to do, okay? Because a lot of times, like we have this, I, I, I don't know, mentality when we read the Bible, like, like we think that, that about Christians 2,000 years ago, like anywhere, but especially Rome, you have to get this idea out of your head that they're not like super Christians, that, 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 that just because these men and women are mentioned in the Bible and, and, and they had faith, that, that God kind of like put this protective magic Jesus bubble around them and they just walked around you know, glowing or something like, and people were like, tell us about Jesus, we want to be Christians. That didn't happen. You need to actually think about these people the opposite way. When someone in Rome, when it was discovered that they, they're a Christian, uh, at minimum, all right, they were persecuted. And I met some persecuted Christians last, last month. They were assaulted, they were beaten, they were imprisoned. Uh, so they lost, lost everything. The best they could hope for is exile. Get out of here, we don't want you in our city. Most likely, it was death. You're Christian, death. By torture, that's why we built this big Colosseum. So we could kill Christians but with gladiators or wild beasts for the entertainment of Caesar or most likely death by crucifixion. The Romans invented crucifixion. It was so horrible, a Roman citizen is not even allowed to be crucified. The Christians in Rome were attempting to build a church and follow Jesus in the capital city of the empire who said, Caesar, government is God. And if you say anything's different than that, we're gonna kill you. And thousands of Christians died Rather than let go of Jesus. All they had to do is say, I don't believe. Oh, then you can go. But thousands said, I, I do believe. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So these Christians are trying to live out their faith in a culture, in a world that is hostile to what they believe and how they want to live their life. Does anybody else feel that sometimes? Right? See, see, here's the other reason that I chose to use the book of Romans as the source for us to consider what are the values and then out of those values, like, like how we're gonna live our lives, live out those values in, in, in America, in, in, in this culture, in Colorado. And that, we can find that in, in the example of the life of Paul, the author of the book of Romans. And honestly, this, this is, I'm so excited about this. This is where I'm gonna lose some of you, all right? Because you're gonna jump ahead in your mind and go, I know where he's going and we're not coming back to this church. Okay, and, and for some of you, you're gonna lean in going, thank you, because this might help answer a question that you haven't been able to answer about how I'm supposed to and how I'm allowed to and not allowed to bring my Christian belief and my values into my life away from here, like at, at work or at school or in culture or in government. See, Paul, right, the author, he was by birth and by religion a Jewish man who was born and raised in a city called Tarsus back in Israel. Now, many of us are familiar with that story, how, how Paul, his original name was Saul. Uh, before he became a Christian, he had these deep Jewish religious convictions. He saw Christianity as, as something bad, as evil. He thought Christianity was anti-God. And so he spent many years trying to eliminate Christianity by persecuting, imprisoning, and then facilitating, like voting for Kill them. He's responsible for thousands of Christians, their families being torn apart, thrown into prison, and crucified. Paul, Paul did that. Then he had a confrontation with Jesus and became one. 
And, and not only that, not only that, after he becomes a Christian, he goes on to be the, the one who is the primary voice to take Christianity outside of the Jewish audience and bring the gospel to non-Jewish people, or the Bible uses the word Gentiles. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. What we miss many times is this. Here's where it's going to get right? Yes, Paul was a Jewish man by birth, and then later a Christian by faith, but legally he was a Roman citizen by secular law. And thus, when Paul is arrested by Jewish political and religious leaders in Israel for his Christian beliefs and teachings and activities, before they could put him on trial and either execute him or excuse him, Paul throws him, hey, I'm a Roman citizen card on the table. I demand my day in court in Rome. As a Roman citizen, I get to stand before Caesar. Now, you gotta, you gotta let that sink in, all right? Please hear this, all right? Paul uses his secular political, I have rights as a citizen of the empire of Rome, and he uses the secular Roman political machine as his final and greatest platform to spread the spiritual message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, and this is going to freak some of you out, all right, right? Paul did not see his Christian faith, his spiritual citizenship in heaven with Christ, and his secular political citizenship in the Roman empire as irrelevant to one another. Paul used his spiritual citizenship to influence his political citizenship, and he leveraged his political voice and rights to serve and spread the gospel. He certainly understood that his relationship with Jesus was personal. Yours is too, okay? But he never once considered his relationship with Jesus to be some private thing that's restricted to a church service or to kind of huddle up with some other people that believe the same things he did. No, no, no. Paul saw life this way. I have one life. And it is impossible to separate out any part of my one life from any other part of my one life. I just got one life, and it all belongs to Jesus. This is how, this is how he says it. Look at this very, very famous verse. He says this when, when he became a Christian. He describes his life this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, my daily life, going to work, going to school, whatever, the, the, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself f- for me. In other words, when I gave my life to Jesus, right, I gave all of it to him. All of it. He is Lord of all of my life. Jesus lives in and is lived out in every part of my life. Or let me put it in the language of this series. My values as a follower of Jesus will drive everything I do in every part of my life. Paul says, I am a Christian and I am a Roman citizen. And my Christianity will form how I will live out my life as a Roman citizen. Does that make sense? Yo, whoa, 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 what, what's that mean for us? And for most of us listening, all right? Here we go, ready? I'll just use my, me language, okay? I am a Christian and I'm an American, which means I am a Christian American and my Christian faith and values, not the Constitution, my faith and faith-formed values will inform how I will live my life out as an American. My citizenship as an American will not define how I will live my life as a Christian. Although, I will leverage every legal and constitutional right I have, every privilege I have as an American citizen to spread the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. I love America, I love Jesus, but America will not decide how I will live as a Christian. Christ, come on, all right. Christ will. Christ will decide, Christ will will, will drive how I will live out my life as an American. My first allegiance is clear because, listen, I plan on following Jesus long after my time on earth is done and I'm no longer an American. Does that make sense? Eternally. Now, so why is this so important right now? Okay, I wanna talk to Christians, right? If you're not a Christian, just go get coffee, right? Listen, all right. Because of this unbiblical, it's a lie that so many of us as Christians, we bought it and we swallowed it and go, that must be right, right? And what I'm talking about is this misinterpretation of the meaning of separation of church and state. The idea that the two aren't allowed to have anything to do with one another, which is not only stupid and irresponsible, but it's impossible. But more than that, it's unbiblical, See, this idea or concept of separation of church and state is to keep the state out of here, out of the church, how, to, how you're allowed to pursue God and live out your life with him. But nowhere in the Bible, by example, or just logical reality, is there any suggestion that you should not allow your deeply held spiritual values and truths that come from Jesus and have formed you and are forming what you believe is right and true 
There's nothing that says that shouldn't influence how you want to see the world, your, your family, your schools, your community, your nation. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, I'm going for it. Uh, here, you want to take a screenshot of this. This is, this is good, right? This is me, right? The only voice that says keep your God life out of government is a government that wants to be God. All right? Now just let it, all right? Caesar, see, Caesar, Caesar government sees your spiritual life and values as competition. And Paul says, whoa, 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 Jesus is God, and I bring all of him into every part of my life. So, so, so again, full disclosure, part of the reason that I chose to do a value series now out of the book of Romans, it should be kind of obvious. In America, in three weeks, this is an election year. Now listen closely. In November, I'm not voting for savior. That role has been filled, all right? My faith and hope are not in government, but as a follower of Jesus, I am going to vote for and whatever policies and agendas that best align with my jesus form values and truths. And to suggest that I should keep that separate or worse yet, not vote at all is naive and irresponsible because I promise, call it whatever you want, the, the faith and belief systems that are opposed to Jesus, they're gonna show up and vote. See, I'm not, all right, I'm not talking about Christian nationalism, so save that email. I'm not, I'm not gonna check my inbox this week, all right? I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that gospel should be the law of the land and that people should be forced to believe in or follow Jesus. That has been tried in the past and has failed every time, as it should have. This is what I'm talking about. This is what Paul said. I got one life, and it belongs to and it is hidden in Christ. Therefore, as a person whose one life has been redefined and is being formed by Christ, that one life must extend to and form how I will live out my life as a Roman citizen and all that goes with that, and it applies to us today. So let's just be really, really honest, okay? I don't mean to be crude or anything. Paul, Paul had his time. And, and, he, and he gave us instructions about how to live our life. And then he gave us his own example. But uh, Paul's dead. He had his time. Now it is our time to decide how we're gonna live out this one life that God has entrusted us to live. This one life that's being formed by the spirit of his son who lives in us. How the values and truths that drive everything that we do will be lived out in every area of our life. Church, home, school, government. Now, now listen, it's dangerous. And to be clear, Paul knew exactly what might happen and did happen when he dares to break the rules and bring his faith into the political and legal arena. When Paul gets to Rome, they put him in prison for several years. He thinks he's just gonna be there for a little while. He's there confined to a house and then eventually he's chained to a wall in a dungeon. He writes letters that will become books of our Bible and he either writes them personally by hand or, or many believe, and this is what I believe because two weeks ago, I was in the prison cell. It's not something like the prison. I was in, it's surreal. This is where Paul was chained to a wall. And so here's what I believe happened, all right? Is that, that he wrote those letters that become books of our Bible from a hole in the ground and shouting up from the darkness through a hole in the ceiling. I saw the hole in the ceiling. And maybe Timothy was up there or maybe a scribe who had stuck his head down there is writing down what Paul's shouting up to him and then he takes the letter to Timothy. For example, here's something Paul wrote from prison. He, said, he says this, and it's to Timothy, this young pastor, who's just getting his butt handed to him because Christians can be hard. And you know who you are. So see, anyway, so, so he, he says, oh, write this down. Hey, tell Timothy this. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you just because you're young, but set the believers an example in speech, watch your mouth, in conduct, how you, how you act, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, see, he still thinks I'm gonna come visit you someday. He doesn't. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. He shouts up the whole, look, here's another thing he, he wrote. This is, this is so good. He says, uh, hey, I wanna remind you, all scripture, right, right here, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for, 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 for re reproof or like rebuke, or like uh, for correction and for training in righteousness, that, that the man, the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What he's saying is, hey, Timothy, values drive everything we do in every part of our life. And Paul, uh, Paul says this, hey, Timothy, listen, it's gonna get rough. Life's gonna get rough. Trust me, I'm chained to a wall. Here's my message. Don't give up, don't quit, Timothy. Keep going, how? Hang on to God, how? Well, look back at that verse again. All right, this, this is how, right? All scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, that the, the man, the woman of, of God may be complete, equipped for every, every good work. Here's our, our first value, our first pillar, okay, that everything stands on. We have to know God. Well, how do you know God? We get to know God through his word. 
Scripture is God's word. It's his voice that is breathed out by God. Why? For us, for your profit, for, for your, your good. If you want to know God, all right, keep on going back to God's word. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. You're doing that right now, right? To, to biblical exhortation. Exhortation, some of us have felt this, all right, means when, 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 it's, when it's really hard, God's word can give you encouragement. Have you ever gone through a hard time and then you remember, oh yeah, I remember what God promised. And when life gets really hard, God's word will bring you consolation. When your life falls apart, somehow God holds you together with what he said is true. He says, Paul, t- Timothy, you gotta go back to it over and over and over. Paul is writing to Timothy and to us. In God's word, you can come to know, to know God. And when you know God, you can learn how life with God works best. In God's word, he'll show you, okay, you're off in this part of your life, and that explains why your life isn't working right now, but I can show you how to get back to where you need to go. It's all right here. If you're willing not just to read it or memorize it or study it, but if you're willing to, to uh, put yourself under the authority of the God who says, I made life and this is how it works best. He says, God will use his word to train up you up in every part of you. You only have one life, so you're equipped to do all that God has for you to do. This is where we find, find that. This is what Jesus said about you know, knowing the word and then, then actually doing the word. He said this, very, very famous story. He says, uh, the, the man, the one, the person who hears these words of mine, and then puts them into practice. He says, that, it's like, that, that person's like a, a, a man who builds his house on a rock. Remember the story? And when the storms of life come, and they will, that house is gonna be fine. It's gonna stand firm, right? But the, the, the person who hears these words of mine, maybe they read them, maybe they memorize them, whatever, but refuses to put them into practice. The, 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 the person who says, I know what it says, I'm not gonna do it. I know what Jesus says. I'm not, I'm not gonna submit to it. I'm gonna do something else. Jesus said this, and it's pretty, pretty strong. You're a fool, You're like a foolish person who builds their house on sand. And the same storm that hit the house on the rock is gonna hit your house, but this time your house is gonna fall apart with a great crash. So to to, to go with uh, the title of the series, the parts of your life that will be still standing are the parts of your life that are built on the right truths, the right values, the right rocks that are all found in God's word that are being lived out in your life. We're We're not talking about, values are not hypothetical things for us to consider. And God's word is not one option among many options, but they all lead to abundant life. No, Jesus says, I'm the way. God's word is truth. Not Jim's, not her truth or his, what's your truth? I don't care. What, God's word is truth. And his truth defines what is of value and those values must drive everything we do or choose not to do in our lives in the church and out of the church. So again, this, this series is not gonna be a series about political life. It's just a series about your one and only life. And what are the driving truths, the values, the pillars that your one and only life is built upon and therefore drives everything that you do in every part of your life because they're all connected. They're inseparable. You can't have a Jesus life and school life, a Jesus life and business life, a Jesus life and a sex life. It's all inseparable. They will determine what will be standing when the storms of life hit. Okay, let's... Let's get back, let's get to Romans chapter one. Uh, let's look at how Paul opens a letter to the Christians in Rome and he's writing to them, but by extension, he's writing to us today. What, what is Paul promising that we can find in God's word? Romans chapter one, here we go. If you don't have a Bible, get one. Okay, here we go, Read. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of, of God. Now, I'm gonna leave that up there. So the way, the way, and you see this all through the Bible, the way that an author would write a letter back then is he or she, they, they start with signing it as opposed to the end of the letter. That's what we do, like love Jim, all right? No, um, but back then it starts with, this is who's writing to you. And so he starts with, oh, so I'm Paul, you might've heard about me, it's not all good, <laughs> I, I'm, but now I'm a servant of, of Christ Jesus. So I serve Jesus and I've been called to be an apostle, called, chosen, prepared, set apart, to be an apostle, a messenger who has been sent to deliver a specific message. In other words, the reason I'm writing you this letter is because, listen, there was a time in my life when my life was about very different things. I now serve Jesus by grace. And every part of my life, is, it belongs to him. And I have a message from Jesus for you. 
So, so what is the message? All right, here it is. Which God, the, right, this, this promise, God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to, to the flesh. So the, so the message God sent me to give you is the same message that you find pro, prophesied, promised all, through all the prophets. Uh, the prophets, uh, when you see that, it's, like, it's what we now call the Old Testament. So what's the promise? Well, it's about God's son. He was descended from David, so through the Jewish line, right? Physically, that's a reference to all the prophecies and genealogies found in the Old Testament. They're all about Jesus. Jesus who was, look, keep going, right? Jesus who was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. So we know, and you can study this if you want, that the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus. Not because he, he meets all the Old Testament prophecies, like he comes from here, he's born here, he'll do things like this, all right? He meets all those, but the biggest one was this. After they crucified Jesus, God's power raised him from the dead, therefore declaring, confirming, Jesus Christ is who he said he is, he's our Lord. That's who sent me. Through, look at this, through whom? Je through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about, and if you have your Bible, underline this, the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Again, leave that up there. I want to break it down. Through whom, through whom we, we have received grace. And, and we're, now we're all apostles, sent messengers of the gospel. At the, the first sentence, Paul says this. He says, like, I've been changed by grace and I've been called to be an apostle. And then he reminds them, he flips it and goes, and so have you. And he's talking to us. So have you, all of us. If you're saved, we've all been saved by the same grace. We, we all have the same calling to do what? And here's where I wanna st start to land this, all right? We can get out here maybe on, maybe on time, all right? Called to do what? To bring about the obedience of faith. To bring about the obedience of faith, why? For the sake of his name among the nations. Paul says this, that this grace that, that we find from Jesus, uh, from cover to cover in the Bible, uh, talks about and teaches this. This grace has the potential, delivers the promise that one of two things, that's not really, it's the same thing, I just don't know what the order is of this thing, all right? Um, but in God's word, here's what we find. We will learn to obey God. And as we obey God and his word, our faith gets bigger. And as our faith grows, we'll obey God more. And then our faith will get bigger. And then we'll obey God more. Why? For the sake of, or on behalf of, not flat irons, not you, his name. Uh, so his name gets bigger and more famous. Among who? The nations. As both our faith grows and our obedience grows, Jesus gets bigger. And here's what Paul is saying, that the message of the Bible, it's all gospel. It's all good news from the first prophets to the, to the person and the life of Jesus to, to the words that Paul is writing that day. The result is the gospel is this. You can know God. And his truth, how? Because we get to know God by knowing Jesus. It's so big, all right? If I said the word, like, well, what's eternal life mean to you? Most of us go to, after my funeral, I go to a Disney castle in the sky. I don't know, right? It's like, I go be good. No, that's not what Jesus said. This is, this is what Jesus says is the goal. Look at this. He says, and this is eternal life. Stop reading, okay? So whatever comes next, it's Jesus, so he's right. Right, I'm about to give you the definition of eternal life. Here it is, this is eternal life, that they, that's us, all right, know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The message of the Bible is the gospel, and the gospel is pure and simply the story of the love of God displayed in the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And the more that we come to know and trust Jesus, our lives will be changed and aligned with Jesus. Faith leads to obedience, submitting and aligning ourselves with Jesus, and obedience leads to more faith. And as we do that, and he does that in us, more and more, Paul says, the nations. Well, well who's that? Everyone. Like the person sitting beside you, let's start there. They're, they're, they're part of this. Um, the person you're married to. Uh, the, the more your faith grows and the more you follow Jesus, it's gonna affect your children, uh, your friends, your, how you're gonna parent. It's gonna affect your parents, all right? I, 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 listen, I, I had a conversation the other day with a man who was living a really, really rough life several years ago, and his 14-year-old son says, it's gotta stop, I'm not afraid of you. And a 14-year-old leads his dad back to Christ because his faith and his obedience. Every person around you every day, 
all the way to the person standing on the other side of the world that I met last week, eventually will have the chance to know Jesus and through Jesus find God. And that's how Paul came to grace. That's how every Christian in Rome came to grace. It's how I came to grace. It's how you came to grace. And anybody who comes after us, that's how they will come to grace. So next week, I'm gonna pick up you know, part two of this first value from a different perspective. But our first value, our first pillar, if you wanna write this maybe in the front cover of your Bible, is you gotta know God through his word. Know God through his word. Now, previously, we called this value biblical authority, right? This is certainly a, a very good description of the value, all right? But, but I, think, I think this, I, know God through his word helps us to keep something clear in our heads. We don't worship a book, right? We don't worship, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's paper and leather, right? It's a book. I met a lady several months ago that when she gets scared, she just sleeps with her Bible on her chest. And it's like, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a rabbit's foot. It's not a, right? And I, I understand, I'm not, even, I'm, I'm not even, you know, critical of her because she just wants something holy next, ne- next to her, right? We don't worship a book. We worship the God that we find in the pages and the stories that's revealed in this book. Does that make sense? And this isn't gonna be a course on apologetics, like building a scientific historical case as to why the Bible is real and you can trust it. We found these scrolls in a cave over here and then we did this and we did that. Blah, blah, blah. that uh, this is, uh, if you want that, we can point you to some great resources. It's called apologetics and they're very, very important. This isn't that. I'm, just not, I'm not smart enough, all right? But it's gonna be much more about faith and repeatedly asking, is what you claim to believe being lived out in your daily life? Which isn't even a question, it's really just a statement. How about this? What you actually believe, what you actually think is valuable, that is what's being lived out in your daily life. The question is this, is there something more valuable, more important that needs to move up up the list? Now, now having said this, I'll say this. This would be the perfect series to invite someone in your life who's like, I don't, I don't, I'm church, uh, I'm suspicious of churches. I, I don't know that. Like, like they're crazy. Those, what's that big one with the stickers on their car? Right, right, right. What do they believe? This series will be super helpful in answering those questions. And honestly, some of you are kind of new around here. Uh, and as, you, as you sit through this series, you might sit in one of our campuses and go like, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that. Those aren't my values. Maybe we should find another church. I agree. Go in peace, all right? See, we're, we're not the only church in town. We're not the, not the best church in town. We're not the right one and they're all wrong, right? But as a church, please hear us. We are very clear on who we are. We always wanna be learning and students. We're not arrogant, but we, we know what we value and where God is leading us, right? All, all the time, I'll be out in the lobby and somebody will come up to me and go, hey, hey, Jim, you know, I got an idea. In my old church, we used to do this and you should do that too. And I'm like, if it worked, why aren't you still there? Go back in peace, all right? So, 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 so this would be a great place to invite somebody, right? Here's the other thing I wanna make clear, all right? And then I'm done, right? At the end of the day, all right, when we get to Thanksgiving, what is it that we hope we accomplish? Because if we get to the end of the series and we can all articulate, like pass the quiz, this is what Flatiron's Church claims to believe, or these are the things I'm supposed to believe if I'm gonna be considered a good Christian, right? That's just words. If that's all we have is some words, then we miss something, and here's what I mean. If we determine that these are the five like, must-have values um, that, that uh, for our church and that our lives must be built on, but those five values don't result in this, we love God better now and we love people better now, then what's the point? Right? Jesus was asked one time, what's the most important thing in the Bible? He said the greatest commandment, that the entire Bible, prophets all the way up to Revelation, right, uh, can all be boiled down to, to, to two connected, ins- inseparable commands. You gotta love God and love people. That's the foundational truth that these five pillars must not only stand on, but whatever is built on them must result in the same thing. We gotta love God, we gotta love people. So I'll I'll just take you through it because hopefully this is where we're gonna land. Value one is we gotta know God. As we open God's word, you know what we're gonna find out? God is love. Value two, we gotta trust Jesus. Okay, where's the love in that? For God so loved the world, that's why he sent Jesus. Value three, we've got to be led by the Spirit. First Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 is a gift, a list of all the things that the Spirit does in a person's life. And then Paul says this, but these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Value four, we have to be united in mission. Jesus told his church, as I have loved you, you must love one another. Value five, we're engaged in the Great Commission. We're gonna leave here and we're gonna go to the world. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. Jesus says this, for the same reason that the Father sent me, love, even so I'm sending you. It's all love. 
Again, why are these values so important? Because they drive everything you do and don't do in your life. And why is that so important? Because the greatest thing we're commanded to do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love her and him and them. Love your neighbor as yourself. How can you love God if you don't know God? And Paul opens up this letter and says, if you wanna know God, the story of God can be found, described, demonstrated, and fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the story of God demonstrating his great love to us through the person of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to, this is the finish line. This is eternal life. We gotta know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. So that's where we're going, all right? All our campuses, I wanna stand up. Oh, we're not gonna sing anymore. You already sang four songs, that's enough, all right? Um, <laughs> I, I wanna leave you with a challenge though, uh, and then I'll pray and, and we'll get out of here. And you don't have to do this, but I really encourage you to do this. As an individual, as a dating couple, as, 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 um, as, as a family, this would be so cool, is that tonight before you get everybody around the table and just go, hey, what do you, what's the most important thing in our house? What do we value the most in our house? I'll give you some example. Like, well, honesty, we don't lie to each other. It's brutal sometimes, but we tell the truth. Or how about respect? You talk to your mom like that one more time <laughs> and we're going outside, right? But you don't, right, respect, honor. Um, is, is purity one of the values of your house? Yeah, we're probably gonna turn the channel because they don't align. Some of us are gonna go, I, I think my kids' sports are the most valuable thing in our life because they drive our entire week. Now here's the thing, all right? I really want you to physically write down honesty, you know, integrity, you know, whatever that is, the four or five of them, okay? As they are, not what you wish they were, as they actually are, demonstrated by this is how we lived our, our, our week. And then here's, here's the goal. Over the next eight weeks, like write these things down in pencil. It's like, I don't, I, I don't want that one on there anymore. It has to go. And then we're gonna replace it with this. And this one's way down here, but actually I think it, it needs to be the standard for everything. You, you see? And just over the next eight weeks, sit down with your kids, sit down with your girlfriend, whatever that is, and go like, hey, we're just getting started in this relationship. Let's start it with the right values. And let's build our life on that. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm gonna pray, and then get out of here, okay? God, your word is good. Uh, sometimes we look and go, I don't understand it. There's parts of that I don't understand. But the reason you gave it to us is not to confine us or to, uh, to, to ruin our fun or, or to uh, just you know, enslave us. You actually say, it's, I, I invented life and I know how life works best. And so this is for your good. It's for your benefit. I know how to get to the abundant life. And for some of us, we're, we're just looking at that list right now going, I, I don't know what my life would look like if that wasn't valuable anymore. And so it feels a little scary, a, a little like unknown. But the one thing I do know and I've experienced from you, Jesus, is you've never told me to do anything that you're not also willing to yoke up with me and take me by the hand and go, let's just do this together. And at, at, at the pace that we can, we're gonna take a step in that direction. We wanna know you, God. We've heard good things about you, but now we wanna experience you. And when we look into the face of Jesus and feel his grace and his love and his compassion, he changes us, and, and that's why we're here. We wanna be more like you. We wanna follow you more so that your name gets bigger. We pray all of this. The only reason we can pray this is because of what you did for us, Jesus, but we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen? Amen, let's go. Thank you so much for watching Flatirons Church Online. We are creating new content and streaming every Sunday. So if you wanna stay connected with us, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And hey, if you believe in what God's doing here, you wanna help us impact the world, go ahead and hit the Give Now button and you will help us reach people in a lost and broken world. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you right here next weekend.